Welcome back. If you haven't checked in, please do that now. Uh, I actually apologize. I inadvertently streamed my property class at the Kamla event, which is why you got a notification today. What would have made it even more confusing is I was actually talking about due process clause in property today. Uh, it happens on free chance that my topics overlap and today's one of those days. So uh, no, you did not miss a class this morning. We're sorry, you know, we frantic and think, oh my god, are we, are we in class? But uh, you guys are good. We need you paying attention. <coughs> Uh, any questions before we get started? Anything on your minds? No? Okay. Uh, I want to start with this question. Okay, this is your question. The Fifth Amendment prevents state governments from taking private property without just compensation. True or false? That's your question. The Fifth Amendment prevents state governments from taking private property without just compensation. True or false? It may be happy people flip their constitution. Very happy. It's like when an angel gets swings, right? <laughs> you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> all right, fine. All right, where did I drop off last time? Who's up next? Brittany, you next? Brittany, what did you put? You put false. Why did you put false? Because if that was true, then Barron and the city of Baltimore were entitled to a really different ruling. Oh, so what was Barron and Baltimore? Remind us. Uh, the one with the sand and the dock that the man sued, but they took over his dock without compensation for his losses. Okay, good. good. Uh, Kelly, did you get it? Kelly, what did you put? Same, I put false. False. Why did you put false? Because the state doesn't have to apply to the states. Ah. Without the state doesn't have to So is that statement false? Yes. In other words, was Barron correct when it was decided in 18, was it 10 or 12, whatever year it was? Would Barron be correct to decide it today? <coughs> Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would, 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 is this statement correct today? Maybe, maybe, maybe he's right. When, when Barron was decided, the statement was, was false. Is this statement true today? Um, I, I, I think in Barron, they would have had a better argument to make it work. Maybe. Forget, forget the 1800s, not today, 2017. Is this statement true today? No, because he has to put the name. Maybe it's true. <coughs> or do you false? I think false. I put false because of the fifth because of the fifth amendment. I say that it would be true if it was replaced with the fourteenth amendment. So if I crossed out if I crossed out fifth and heard fourteen, would that be a true statement? I would say so. What? But it doesn't say fourteen, it says fifth. Right, right. Oh, you see what she's getting at, right? So <coughs> let's turn to our test, right? Let's see what the results were. <laughs> All right, more false than true. Um, I, I, I think false is probably the better answer at this one uh, uh, because the way I framed it. The way, the way I think, if I want to reframe it, I'll, I'll, I'll type it below separately so you can see it, will be something like this. The Fifth Amendment, as incorporated by the Fourteenth Amendment, 
<clears throat> that is what Jay was getting at, right? This would be an interesting statement like this. But the reason why I frame this question for you is far too often lawsuits that we say, oh, wow, that's a First Amendment case. That's a Fifth Amendment taking case. It's actually wrong. Um, Any time you have a case where the state's police power is limited by something the Bill of Rights, it's actually a 14th Amendment case, right? So don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. Always be sure it's a fifth as incorporated by the 14th Amendment. But I want you guys to take a look at this office now. I want you to take a look at the text of these provisions, right? The Fifth Amendment, the fifth amendment provides that nor shall private property be taken without just compensation. And this provision, at least as originally understood, prevented the federal government from seizing <laughs> private property unless it was for public use, and if so, they have to pay you for it. That gives you just compensation. But then we get down to the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment doesn't have takings clause, right? It's not like when the 14th Amendment was enacted, they just basically copied and pasted the first eight amendments all over again. They didn't do that. Instead, they gave us this provision, due process clause, which said, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And we'll get to Harlan's opinion in the uh, Chicago, Burlington, Quincy Railroad case in a few minutes. But, um, Abiyami, I think you're next. How do we get from the Fifth Amendment to preventing the city of Chicago from taking private property? What's the, what's the thought process of how the 14th Amendment imposed new restraints on state police power? Walk me through this. How do we get from Barron v. Baltimore, which I think was correct in the society, Chicago v. Quincy Burlington, the Quincy Burlington Railroad case, right? How do we make that jump? What, what is the framework, what is the approach of extending the takings clause to the states? Before the 40th Amendment, Chicago could take as much property as it wanted. It didn't have to pay a penny. But what's the approach? Why can Chicago now not do that? Well, I think it's an honor and name of answering the question that it's a due process clause of the 14th Amendment in state supervision on non confiscations and what I'm looking for is the 14th Amendment in state as well. Well, where is the just compensation clause? Is it, is it in the 5th Amendment's due process clause? It's in the 14th Amendment. Where, I'm asking, where is the just compensation clause found? The Right, there's no just compensation clause in the 14th, is there? No, there's not. All right. I'm sorry, Rachel. Sorry. Rachel, <coughs> how do we get from Barron to the Chicago Quincy case? How do we get there? What's, I promise he's building something important, I promise. What, what, what happened? What's the approach? Um. So uh, the, the approach is applying the Fifth Amendment through the 14th How? Amendment. Um, well, the quote I liked is, the due protection of, uh, of the rights of property is so vital, um, and it only second to the degree of personal liberty. So um, I don't know. I, I think that they're saying it's connected. So it Does Justice sense. Harlan at any point in his opinion mention the takings clause? Does he even, does he even cite it? I don't think so. Doesn't. So what's going on here, right? Eric, mm -hmm. tell me. Oh no, I go. I jump. No, which way am I going? Uh, Are you gonna... Yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. I uh... <laughs> last year, I don't know what happened, but there were two students here, and I just consistently skipped over them. And they they were saying, "Oh, you're doing it deliberately." I swear it's not purpose. <laughs> Jessica, I'll go back up top. What's going on here, right? <laughs> you will be a minute later. <laughs> 
He knows not to listen. <laughs> Jessica, tell me, what is Harlan doing? If that's the case, or he's going to describe it in two seconds, Chicago city government tried taking some land for the railroad. They awarded it to one dollar compensation. And they challenged the violation of taking clause. The compensation was not just. That's a fact, right? How does Justice Harlan think that the states are prohibited from seizing private property that that's a just compensation? He doesn't, Rachel's right, he doesn't even mention the taking clause, not once. It's not even cited anywhere. This, this is a case that nobody really understands. It's not even. What is Harlan's approach? Really close. What do you need to process the conversation? I think you're saying slightly the wrong thing, but give me another go. Like, Good. I like that. Why is it a monster of just take your property without giving you any compensation? Because it's kind of like um, an empty gesture, I guess, if you don't just get compensated. What would you call that? You know, say, say, say you were the guy who had his land taken away to build a railroad and you had a dollar. What would you say? No. 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 What would you say? How does that make you feel? This is what? Cheating. Cheating and not. Not just. Unjust. Fair, just, whoever said it, right? Yeah. Not, not, thank you, you guys did a tag for it, thank you, right? <laughs> not fair, right? That's Harlan's basic point, right? He doesn't need the Fifth Amendment to get to his result. He's saying that just as a matter of course, it is fundamentally unfair for the city of Chicago to seize property without providing adequate compensation. It's just not fair. Even in Harlan's mind, if the Fifth Amendment had never been ratified, right, we just had the Fourteenth Amendment, the case would print the exact same way. I mean, think about that for a second. If the Fifth Amendment had never been ratified, the case would print the exact same way. Because it's just not fair. Now, Jonathan, why is it unfair for the government to take your property and only use you a dollar for it? Why is that so unfair? Why is it not fair, right? If the government wants to build a railroad, this is the public good. Why is it unfair to give you a dollar and say have fun with it? Just Why is it unfair? How, do we, how does Harlan know? Or let me ask the question differently. Who is John Marshall Harlan to say what's fair and what's not fair? Who is he to say? Since like the principle of universal law. Says who? Not the framers of the Fourteenth Amendment. They didn't write that down. Right there, it's all it says. Back. Who is Harlan to say that something's not fair? What gives him that right? The city of Chicago thought it was fair. They gave over a dollar. Judge and there was a judge in Chicago gave over a dollar. So that's just fine. The jury, the jury thought a dollar was fine. Who is Harlan to second guess that? I mean, as a justice of the Supreme Court. That's why is his judgment any better than the jury who awarded a dollar and the judge in Chicago? Yeah, I'd say it's really not. Anthony, what does it mean for something to be not fair? You know, anyone have a little younger brother or sister, and like the first thing they learn to say is, that's not fair, right? What? I, my sister would say it all the time. I mean, it's yeah. well, why, why is this not fair, Anthony? Well, who decides what fair is? Uh, I mean, I guess. Just what's in your in your mind if you think it's fair or not. Your mind, so so it's subjective. If whatever Harlan thinks, maybe someone else thinks it is fair. That he, the city of Chicago thought it was fair. They want their railroad to be built. The jury in Chicago thought it was fair. They gave her a dollar. Are they, are, are they idiots? Are they are they immoral people? Are they like you know awful human beings? I don't think they're, they're idiots. I think they wanted they saw the good in the uh, the railroad and they figured that it would be. 
fair to give this guy a dollar and just show that. So different people might agree on what's fair and not fair, huh? Yeah. So uh, let me let me change directions for a brief moment. Did anyone ever read the short story The Lottery? Anyone? Amber, you want to? Uh, actually, let me do it so you don't give away the ending. Um, so there's a story. It's it, it's it's like a. So there's a story called The Lottery, right? And you have a small town that 300 people there, and it's summer, and they're getting ready to plant for the harvest. And there's something known as a lottery. And every year they say, if we have a good lottery, the harvest will be good. Um, so they start preparing for the lottery, and they make out these little paper slips, and they put the slips into this, into this safe to be kept in safekeeping. Now, one of the slips has a black mark on it, right, only one. So they have this drawing. And so the first round, the head of the household draws a slip until everyone in the household, or every head of the household gets a slip. So then one person, Bill Hutchinson, gets this black uh, slip with the black spot. Then they draw again. Numbers. Okay. So then all the members of the Hutchinson family drew these little slips of paper. And Bill's wife, Tessie, pulls the piece of paper with the black mark on it. Amber, what happens next? She gets stoned to death. Yeah. You didn't see that one coming, did you? <laughs> she gets stoned to death, thank you. So the question, and I always use this example, uh, Case, was her execution fair? <laughs> I see you struggling there. <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. Why? Why do you say yes? She <laughs> But what, okay, so let, 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 let's break this down one step at a time, right? Case, was there anything rigged about the selection process? Was it a fair draw? Was there any allegation that she cheated or that someone like rigged stacked the deck against her? So procedurally, right? Were there any discrepancies? You know, were there stuck ballots? You know, were there two black spots? Was everything procedurally fine? So is there anything wrong then with her execution? I guess not according to the rules. Uh, Carlo, what do you think, my friend? Um, is this a fair execution? Fair? Uh, that's the word I use. A, according to the rules, yeah. I mean, so, so if you play by the rules, it's fair no matter what the result that this woman got stoned. If they consented to it. They, they all consented to participation in it. So, uh, but I think... That wasn't, in fact, an evidence, but I'll, but I'll take it, right? Okay. In fact, Tessie, as she was getting stoned to death, I think she said, it's not fair. That was one of her last dying words. It's not fair. <coughs> Kevin, is this fair? I would say it's not fair because she lost her life. Because, because of why did she lose her life? Because she played in a silly game. Completely random, right? Yeah. Arbitrary. That, that, you know, if she pulled one inch over to the other piece of paper, she'd be alive. David, is this a fair process? Or let me ask the question a little bit different, David. Did she get due process of law? In other words, was she deprived of her life? Yes, she was killed, right? Did she get due process of law before she was deprived of her life? Yeah. Why do you say yes? Because, I mean, I don't think she'd say it would embarrass someone else that's done with that. I mean, uh, they all had an equal chance of... They all had an equal chance of drawing the black slip, right? Mm -hmm. Technically, I mean... Yeah. You know, No, but with, with probability, it, it, each person has equal good chances. You know, remember, remember high school, uh, a probability. It's random every shot. But each draw, you, your chances increase, yeah. so the but probability you, but, you, but maybe the, But maybe, but you don't open your slips till the very end. Well, that's new rule. No, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, they, they open the slips at the end. Adam, did she, did she get the due process of law? No, it was random. There's no due process. The process was followed. This guy's saying the rules were followed just fine. Case, you know, they're, 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 why is that not process? Why didn't she get the due process of law? Because there really was no process there. But there was a process. What was there not, though? Due process of what? Law. <laughs> why is it law, Mark? I'll come back to you. 
No, I didn't say it. Yeah, you. Oh, was it you? No, I said yeah. Oh, I heard that. Yeah. I heard you know, it was yeah, yeah. my hearing was like, right, <laughs> that, that, you know, that thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, Brandon, what, what, why is there no law here? Well, I mean, the law isn't, isn't necessarily, uh, there could be a law, but evidently those laws are well, What if I told you that the previous year, the city council had voted upon this, and every member of the community said, yeah, let's do this, this is a good idea. <laughs> Well, that's the, that's the law. Every member of the community said, yeah, we want a good harvest, let's, let's do this. That's the law they, they, they are, not, maybe not arbitrarily, but who knows, maybe they're materialists or... Uh, Amber, what makes something law? Is there any, is there any requirement? Is just whatever you vote for is law and that's the end of the story? Proper. Proper? What's, what does proper mean? And who judges whether the law is proper or not? Well, I guess the legislature. The People vote on it. In fact, this is a town hall. Everyone voted. You know, this is you know, New England town hall. Everyone voted for it. Well, I think the problem in this in the story was there was no reasoning behind. Oh, there's a reason. They wanted a good harvest. That's the reason. I gave you one. That's the reason they wanted a good harvest. And if you get a good lottery, it's a good harvest. Why would there not be due process of law here? What's the Supreme Law of Land? Yeah, but I told you there was a process. They enacted it. They voted for it. Why is that not due process? So. Here, here is what I'm getting at, and I think I think some of you, some of you see it. All right, Jerry, you want to say something? I think that what we're grappling with is there isn't balance. There isn't a give and a take. There isn't a space where you're taking. But if you change the the, the law and say, well, the whole town, including her, voted, then it would be. What if we change it? What if every year there's a ballot and we decide to do a stone? Right. Let's make it not random. We have a ballot, and everyone's name is in the ballot. Whoever gets the most votes gets stoned to death. It's felt like unpopularity. Uh, this is uncongeniality, right? Even it sounds like America today. Um. But, but now I'm asking you, what if that's you, you, every year, you said the population is too high, we're going to stone one person, whoever gets the most votes gets stoned. Pure ballot, everyone gets one vote, fair vote. Anonymous ballot. <laughs> I don't think that it means they will be balanced for the people who are voting each year. Yeah, the person gets stoned is a rough end of that. Let me, let me, let me, I'll come back to you guys in a second. Let, let me do a little bit first. What you're basically saying, and I think most of you are getting at, is this law is insane, right? It makes no sense. It's utterly irrational. Why in the world is one person getting stoned to death because she drew a little piece of paper with a black mark on it, right? Why in the world is the person getting stoned to death because they got the most, the most votes on whatever ballot we would put together? When we're talking about due process of law, at least in this context, you are not only asking whether the procedure is fair, you are also asking whether the procedure and the law itself is just, is wise. Does the law itself make sense? Right? That's the question you ask yourself when you do the due process clause. I don't even cover what's called procedural due process, right? It's a topic which I just don't have time for because it's not very important. You know, what sort of hearing, what sort of trial do you get if the government wants to take away your life and your property? That's what's called procedural due process. For virtually the rest of the semester, we'll be talking about substantive due process. The notion that courts can assess not just whether a law is procedurally fair, but whether the substance of the law is fair, right? If you, if some, you know, town in Texas tries to enact a law saying we will stone the person who has the most votes every year, they go to court and say, "Look, judge, it's fair. We have we have this really lock solid procedure by anonymous ballot." The judge says, it's "Absolutely not. Taking someone's life because of a random draw of a ballot is not consistent with due process of." law, right? It's a notion that the law has to have some justness to it. And as courts have interpreted it, one way or the other, they get to decide whether a law is fair or not. 
And that's Harlan in the first page. Harlan does not cite the takings clause, doesn't even mention it. He's saying, as a matter of course, it's unfair for the city of Chicago to seize property without providing adequate compensation. It's totally unfair, right? It was that he's not simply signing the takings clause. He doesn't even mention the damn thing. He says, it's not consistent with the due process of law to allow a person to go to jail, I'm sorry, to, to lose their property without giving them adequate compensation. That's what Harlan's saying, right? And maybe you agree with it, maybe you disagree with it, but the notion is a judge gets to decide whether law is fair or not. Now again, the city of Chicago thought it was fair. The jury get the one dollar damage, thought it was fair. The judge in the Chicago courthouse thought it was fair. Harlan didn't. And I respect Harlan, he's a bright guy, but he's a judge like anyone else. So the difficulty with substantive due process is invariably a judge puts his own judgment of what is fair over whatever the legislature or the executive decided was fair. It's often said that judges do not second guess the wisdom of the legislature. Of course they do. Of course they do. He's saying that this $1 judgment was not fair. Lochner, right? The, uh, the judgment of, uh, of New York to ban working more than 60 hours a week was unfair. It was an arbitrary infringement on liberty of contract, right? The state of Texas wants to ban sodomy. That's not fair. People want to love each other, right? These sorts of decisions are basically a judge saying, I disagree with your judgment call. And they can couch it in terms of life, liberty, property, and everything else, but it's the lottery. And whenever we do a substantive due process case now or next week or the week after, think back to the lottery, right? Is this some sort of completely arbitrary random law? Is it putting someone in a bad spot, perhaps not execution, but something short of it? Putting you in jail for uh, engaging in a sex act, right? Is, it, is, that, is that fair? Is that, is, that, is that a just application of the word liberty, right? This is the, the modern day basis of the doctrine of constitutional law. Right? The notion of due process of law, by the way, was not invented in uh, Dred Scott. We, we discussed this, right, where uh, Chief Justice Taney wrote that um, the Fifth Amendment protects the right to own slaves. Remember, we discussed this. It wasn't invented in, in Dred Scott. Uh, the notion of uh, due process of law goes all the way back to Magna Carta, year 1215, when the uh, the barons uh, gave King John an ultimatum, sign this great charter or else we'll depose you. And uh, King John gave up these various rights, which he said that people should not be thrown in prison except for the law of the land. This phrase, law of the land, is synonymous with due process of law, that there's some higher law above the king, and that cannot be violated. And again, this, this creates the notion that some laws, even if duly enacted, even if there's a process, are unfair. You can't be executed simply because you draw a slip of paper, right? You can't be executed because you get the most votes. So there's actually some fairness to it beyond the process. Questions on that, please? Mark? Did I understand the reading correctly that Bill Hutchins actually pulled it first, but his life was spared? It was a two-step process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the way it works is you first have the head of the household draw a piece of paper, and then there's a second round of drawing triple in the household. Oh, okay. So because Bill, the husband, drew the, the, the paper, his entire family was then subjected to this process. Gotcha. So in other words, if the wife wasn't selected, the husband could have been. So it makes it even more messed up. Or the six-year-old daughter. But this is a, um, exactly, but this is like, the, the reason why they have this double procedure is even decrease, or I guess increase the randomness, right? That it's not just one draw, it's two draws. And it makes it even more fair, I suppose. I think that the author of the Hunger Games stuff a bit off that. Yeah, I think you're, I hear that. I think it's probably a similar idea, like who gets to live and who dies. Andre, Sarando? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's weird that people say it's not fair. It's consistently. So you think it is fair? I think it's extremely fair. You, you think the execution and drawing the, the number from the hat or whatever it is? Yeah, I mean, everybody has the exact same chance. I mean, and you can't reap the benefits of having a good harvest every year, right? If you don't commit to the sacrifice reap, reap, very, very good words, right? You reap. Yeah, you reap what you sow. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I, I, I guess a lot of people haven't read it, but uh, there's that one kid. I think, I think his entire family has been has drawn, and so they don't. He, he doesn't have to draw anymore because he's the last member. I don't remember if it's Jack, maybe was his name. Uh, I don't recall this. Either story, way, yeah. yeah. So I guess that wouldn't be fair. But ultimately, the whole point of the of her saying that's not fair at the end is that it was. It's extremely fair. Oh, so, so the you, government still has the right to take your life, you know? If they give you what? Under, under what circumstances can they take your life? 
I'm pointing. Under what circumstance may they take your life? Keep reading. They can take your life with due process of law. So the question is, does the lottery afford due process of law? Do you think it does? I think, yeah. I think and not the impact upon you. It gives you the one same time, time, process that everybody else gets. So equal process is fair. Equal. Cool. Yeah. 102 equal. Aaron, I think you're next anyway, so you can go. Well, I just had a question. I, I think I might, might have misread this. So did the court end up saying that there was a violation of court? No, they, they punted on it. And at the very end, they said, well, we don't have to decide $1 or nothing. Basically, the, the, the decision was to take it. The decision was this. So I'll summarize the holding in uh, the Harlan opinion because it's a little bit complicated. The holding is this. <clears throat> States cannot take property without just compensation. That violates the due process clause, it's unfair. But we don't have to decide if they get $1 or something. Right? It, it was a weird holding. He had Justice Brewer, who dissented in part, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We have this entire opinion about how this is unfair and you let the guy off with $1, that's bogus. Now, the, the way railroads work, and you ever taken property to yet, is you have what's called an easement. An easement is allowing them to cross your land. So, the, the taking in this case is that credit for, you know, how wide is a train, like, you know, how okay, my arms are that long, but, you know, a fairly small strip of land, and maybe the, the, the value of that was only one dollar. So, it was a very strange opinion. I don't want to focus on that too much, right? But the important point is, as a matter of fairness, they'll be deprived of property without due process of law, even though they have a trial, even though they have a judge, a jury, and all that other stuff. Okay? Yeah, right. Is it worth noting that um, Harlan doesn't do anything differently than the, than the signers of the Declaration of Independence did when they appealed to nature's God? Ah. When, he, when he says um, it's founded in natural equity, I mean, he's doing the same thing uh, that they did, so it's the same way of developing law, appealing to what you believe to be now, universally true. Is that a role for judges or for people who are in the other branch of government? Well, I, I think inherently it'll people will will judge or read laws according to what they what they think. And what if two different true. judges disagree about what the higher law is? What if two people disagree about what liberty means? I think that's where a lot of our, even our contemporary conflict uh, is sourced from. I think you're right. So Aaron, I'll come back to you, man. What, what's liberty? What's the word liberty mean? The 14th Amendment's right there. Uh, what's liberty? Reason. Okay, get, you're going to sit down and describe it in more words. <laughs> Define liberty as an absence of government. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're saying, no without the interfering without the due process. Yeah, so you're saying if the government leaves you alone, that's liberty. Is that what you're saying? To an extent. So, so, so absence. Extent. A little laissez faire. Laissez faire? What's that? <laughs> no, no. You said it. You said it. You said laissez faire. You can't speak French and Scott without translating. <laughs> Well, hands off, is that what you're telling me? Uh, ah, not completely hands off, but maybe just like, oh, a, maybe like a couple steps back. <laughs> Jason, what's the reason, my friend? Is it just the absence of government government can be taken out of the way? I don't know that it's the absence of government, but the allowance of government to, to kind of live and speak and, and do things without, especially, so you go from a society where you have a king, <laughs> And the king and, and his chief lords, they, they tell you what's okay, what you can and can't do all the time. 
this, now you have a government that says, do, unless you do X, Y, or Z. Oh, whoa, 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 what do you mean government policy can't do that? Who says, we just hold on, right? Uh, <laughs> because I think what they do is they, they try to govern how we interact with each other. Why, why? Uh, no, liberty, liberty. Why, government can't tell them what to do, it's my, my job. What, how is that? As long as it doesn't intrude on the rights of others, so where did you get this from? I didn't. It's not right there. Where did you get this from? Probably other than rights in that bill. You know, I don't know. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> Jackson. So you go out, you do something, and the cops come and they uh, they arrest you. They say, "Why are you arresting?" I say, "Well, you were you were beating up this other guy. You were punching this other guy." You say, "No, oh, it's my liberty. I can do what I want." Your liberty, do what you wish. Why? Why can't you go punch some other guy up? Because there's always a limitation. I think even on liberty, there's a limitation. Because there's a law. When you punch someone out, what do you do to their freedom? Oh, two sides, right? Two sides. So, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Guys, one at, one at a time, please, one at a time. Abraham Lincoln said, you know, a long time ago, this is not like a meme, he actually said this. He said, um, <laughs> We all declare for, for liberty. Sorry, we all declare for liberty. But in using the same word, we do not all mean the same thing. And he uses this great example. He says, the shepherd drives the wolf from the sheep's throat. Right? The shepherd drives the wolf from the sheep's throat. For which the sheep thanks the shepherd as a liberator. While the wolf denounces the shepherd as a destroyer of liberty. Whoa, right? So you have a sheep getting attacked by a wolf, and you have a shepherd come in. And the sheep's like, oh God, thank you so much, you're giving me freedom. And the wolf's like, what the hell? Where's my freedom? I want to have dinner, right? So the question of what is liberty is uh, very much dependent, I suppose, on where you sit. Are you the person punching? Jackson, right? No. Or are you the person getting punched? <clears throat> well, I was going to say, so with liberty, there has to be balance because you could be on any side of that coin at any moment. Oh, you, you could be can. the one punching or the one getting punched. You can flip that foot real quick, right? So the balance of it that you want to have freedoms, but you also want to be protected. So, Brent, I'll give you the next question then. So, then if you have a judge trying to interpret for liberty, what do they have to go on? That's a question. You have this 14th Amendment that was written, ratified 1868, 150-something years ago, right? What do you do? You're a judge. All you have to go on is the rulings that have been before you with the situations that have happened. No, there's no precedent. You're dealing with a new issue. You can't, you can't dodge a precedent. Then, it's your opinion, really. Your opinion, huh? Your opinion, that's all you got. Um, Where do you go on? I would say as long as it doesn't overtly negatively affect another person or thing or what they feel, then you're, that's your right to the to Yeah, these, are, these aren't easy questions. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here, and I'm, I'm deliberately dry because I promise we'll get to the case, I promise, is once you go in the realm of judges deciding, has due process of law been afforded? or when you're in the realm of a judge deciding what is a liberty interest, you're, you're getting to some very difficult determinations, right? Lincoln said, my meaning of liberty is not the same as your meaning of liberty. And I think Lincoln was exactly right. You're the sheep, you're the wolf, right, at any given point in time. So there are different attempts by the Supreme Courts to um, confine this word liberty. So one of the approaches of how to define liberty, and this is probably the least controversial of all the approaches, is to say it includes the first eight amendments to the Bill of Rights. Right? That this conception of liberty embraces the first eight amendments to the Bill of Rights. So wouldn't it be nice if you had one decision in the Supreme Court saying, aha, we are herefore extending the entirety of the first eight amendments of the Bill of Rights to the states now. Godspeed, go. 
Uh, no such decision exists. Instead, the Supreme Court did the most complicated thing fathomable. They incorporated each clause one by one. As the case came up, then, ah, the jury trial, ah, uh, the free speech provisions, ah, the Second Amendment, you know, one case at a time. And actually, some provisions have not been incorporated. I mentioned this last week. The Third Amendment, never incorporated. The, uh, the grand jury provisions, never been incorporated. Uh, the requirement to have a unanimous criminal jury conviction has never been incorporated. The Seventh Amendment right of trial by jury, never been incorporated. So there are some provisions that just don't incorporate. But for all intents and purposes, this word liberty will embrace the first eight amendments of the Constitution. Um, ironically enough, the Fifth Amendment, the takings clause, was never really incorporated. The Harlan case didn't even mention incorporation. Didn't even mention it. That is for a fairness approach. Okay? But once we get beyond the Bill of Rights, to find the word liberty, it gets very fuzzy. And the question becomes this. How is a judge to define the word liberty? How? Does he look to natural law? Brandon mentioned that a minute ago. Does he look to international law and what other countries are recognizing? Does he look to the 14th Amendment and the sorts of things the framers were concerned with? Do you look to the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which guaranteed various rights to the freedmen? Right? What do you look to to give meaning to this phrase liberty? Keep in mind as we do this topic, when a state legislature defines liberty in one way, perhaps it's rights of workers to get treatment in a certain you know, fashion or certain wages. And then the court says, no, 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 that's not liberty. I want to focus on the liberty of the contract, that the people can negotiate their wages. You have these competing definitions of liberty, but invariably the court decides which one will prevail. This is why this, this concept of substance of due process is so um, contentious. Because you have a court stepping and saying, no, 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 you thought that was a good idea. I do not because it violates liberty. Why is it violate liberty? It goes down from there usually. Uh, yes, sir, Jason. Do you think that Justice Harlan is talking about what's fair to provide some constraints in that? So one one way that you know maybe our government differs from the king is it doesn't matter why the king asks you to do something. He's the king, you have to do it. So like the lottery is not necessarily fair because it doesn't make sense why they're actually doing it. And so he uses the term fair to set confines when you think of liberty, it shouldn't be arbitrary. Uh -huh. There should be something. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think Justice Harlan, it, it, this is a, it's a very good question. Harlan understood a certain legal system that we just don't have anymore. Um, the notion of what was fair in the 1890s when these decisions were written is probably very different from what it is today. And I think in Harlan's mind, to have a country that you call a free republic and to not provide compensation was basically impossible. I mean, that's basically what he wrote. Like, you can't have a free country if the government goes around taking property. There was another case Harlan decided around the same time called Hurtado in California, H-U-R-T-A-D-O. And this considered whether California was required to indict people or grand jury to indict people. And Harlan said, of course they are. How can you have a free society without uh, a grand jury deciding whether charges should proceed? It makes sense, right? It's a little the other way. So Harlan had a very specific notion. Even Lochner, right? Lochner, which we'll get to in a minute, his sense is there is a liberty of contract, right? The, the government can't make arbitrary infringements on your contract rights, but the New York Bay Shop law was okay. So Harlan had a strong sense of what a republic required for freedom. Um, where did he get that from? You three have to think the same way I do, this really didn't much. But he did have a strong sense of what was required. And I think that was a byproduct of he was around the time of the 14th Amendment, he was in existence, he was alive, he was a lawyer, he studied it. And with certain legal understandings that we don't have anymore. Um, it's a hard thing, but certain things which we take so much for granted today, we just never talk about. We just take for granted. So it's much the same way I think in the 1870s and 80s. Hey, Martin. 
given life, liberty, and property were uh, originally John Locke's words, would it be apropos to analyze liberty through his understanding of the social contract? Ah, betwixt Locke and, uh, and uh, the Constitution, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Too easy. Uh, I think it's apropos. So the question, the question is this, right? Can we look to common law concepts? Can we look to the writers of the natural law? Social contract theory, right? I mean, the, the phrase life, liberty, property was not only in the 14th Amendment, but also in the 5th Amendment. And can we use Lockean theory to define this? Okay, How, let's use Locke. How does this come out? Well, people would have absolute liberty except for that which they give up to live in society. Ah, and that's I think what someone else said, right? But then what happens if they start punching someone else? Well, that's part of the liberties that we give up to be in society. So we have, I mean, I, I don't want to get too far into John Locke, but he was a very important um, writer and legal thinker and, and philosopher. And he had this idea of a social compact that more or less, uh, in the state of nature, you know, people are savages and they're always killing each other, right? Property is not safe. Uh, to eradicate that uncertainty, people will come together for a social compact or a contract where they say, we will delegate some of our power to the central authority to keep us safe. So you have this freedom which you give up in order to have security. Um, I think that was a very influential uh, uh, thinking uh, on the founders. Uh, so the protection of property, one of the reasons why government exists is to protect property. So if the government's arbitrarily taking your property without compensation to Harlan, that's utterly unlocking, right? It unlocks the, uh, the charter, so to speak. The questions on that. So this this forty five minute wind up is, is more or less directed at a single question, right? How do you decide what's a fair law? How do you decide whether infringement on liberty is without due process? How do you decide when a contract regulation is unreasonable? And these are not hard and fast rules. If you if you read these cases, you notice there's very little citation to case law. You notice that? They cite maybe social science and you know how many people are sick and you know the, the, the fatality rates and the date, you know, but there, there's very little case law because they just don't have much. You'll notice a very big difference between the first half of the semester with the structural cases and the second half of the semester, which are the rights cases. They, they look completely different, right? They just don't have the same feel, right? After today, you know, I, I always have like a clause of the Constitution, the board. This is going to be it for the next three weeks. That's it. I don't have anything else to show you. Right? Adam? I feel like the poor conversation is sort of kind of the fundamental basis of our current political system is how much government, you know, should we have? And that goes back and forth between the Democrats and Republican parties. And the, it sounds like what the makeup of the court is based off of, you know, who was in power when it was a seat open kind of determines, you know, the understanding of the Constitution for the next couple of decades. Uh, yes. Uh, the, in large measure, when you have this notion of substantive due process and courts recognizing unenumerated rights, there, uh, there's a lot at stake in who those people recognizing their rights are and who was appointed to the court. Right? Um, Mark was showing me the... I saw you guys talking about something. Well, he, he thought this would be important. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, you know, an evangelical, you know, unashamedly, but... Um, Wikipedia says a Christian. Oh, you're good. Christian Don't say Wikipedia. Just tell me your own words. I can't remember. <laughs> I once had a student correct me saying, "Oh, I saw it on Wikipedia." I was like, Give me a break. Just tell me your own words. A Christian fundamentalist, Harlan's uh, Christian beliefs strongly shaped his views during his tenure as Supreme Court. Um. Uh, yeah, I'm going to just demur on Wikipedia. Thank you, though. And there are a lot of biographies. There's nothing that, unusual about, about someone's. Yeah. Um, Har Religious Harlan actually taught Sunday school. Yeah. Foundation for how they. No, I understand. Harlan that. actually taught Sunday school every week. He was actually quite devout, so I'm familiar with his background. But uh, I, I haven't seen anything that connects to. But I will. I will take Wikipedia for its worth. <laughs> no, but thank you though. If, if you find a biography, something reputable, I'd be happy to discuss it. But just Wikipedia, you don't want to trust. Law school. So you're saying he wasn't? That's not true. I don't know. I, I don't trust Wikipedia. Okay, well, I'll look at that. Please do find a book. Okay. Thank you. Anything else we're going to move on? Okay. So let's do the first case. Well, 40, 50 minutes in. Um, <laughs> no, I, this is quite deliberate. I, I, I 
I actually have a very specific frame for each class that I follow more or less. You notice I never spill over, it's very deliberate. Um, the first case, uh, Lochner versus the people of the state of New York. Um, uh, it's a criminal case, by the way. People don't quite appreciate it. The guy actually went to jail uh, for, 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 the, for the facts in this case. Um, Lochner is called one of the most infamous cases, and scholars often compare Lochner to Dred Scott, uh, Korematsu, Plessy, or Ferguson. And you may, ask, you may ask, why, right? How could this case about a baker in upstate New York working too much possibly rank next to Dred Scott, right? Or Korematsu, or Plessy, right? Or these, you know, awful, awful cases. And the reason why is that this case came to represent the wrong way to read the Constitution, so people said. That is, courts should not be in the business of substituting their judgment for the judgment of the legislature. That the legislature decides that people can only work 50 or 60 hours a week, that's it. And if those laws are designed for the protection of the public good, that's it. And that it's a judicial abuse to strike down the law unless you have some clear reason to do so. Um, the real reason why this case became so <coughs> popular is the New Deal. And this is a period we've already talked about. In the early years of the New Deal, the Supreme Court would stand up to Roosevelt and invalidate many acts of federal legislation. But they also invalidated acts of state legislation, various progressive laws involving wages and, and hours and sanitation and sorts of things. So Lochner was vilified as a way of saying courts should not be in the business of recognizing unwritten rights, and the courts should generally defer to the elected process. Now, that was the law for decades, from the 1930s to the 40s to the 50s. But then something changed in the 1960s. Sex, drug, and rock and roll, right? You had a case called Griswold v. Connecticut, which we'll study, which involved, does the 14th Amendment guarantee a right to contraception, birth control, for married couples? Now, if you were following the Lochner dissent, the answer is, of course it does. We're not going to read our policy preferences into the word liberty. We're just going to stick to the facts. But the Supreme Court in Griswold ruled the other way and said that the 14th Amendment protects a right to birth control. It's not written anywhere. The framers of the 14th Amendment would not even know what birth control was. The pills didn't exist. Right? These are novel things. And years later, in a case like Roe v. Wade, Lawrence v. Texas, Vergafel, the court used this doctrine of substitute due process to invalidate laws that they deemed were unfair and unwise. So there's this weird tension where Lochner is still held up as this reviled decision of courts making crap up. Yet the exact same doctrine is used to invalidate birth control laws and sodomy laws and abortion laws. Now, you can make a distinction saying, well, liberty of contract is not a real right, but uh, uh, access to birth control and abortion is a fundamental important right. Well, that simply begs the question, why is one more important than the other? Lincoln, right? My sense of liberty is different from yours. So the courts never quite uh, approach this, where they say, yes, Lochner's evil, we don't want to do Lochner, but we'll do Rome. Um, those rights are not fundamental, but, but, but abortion is. Um, as long as you appreciate the reason why Lochner has fallen into this, this, this sort of anti canon that we're just not supposed to cite it, uh, you'll be in a much better shape. Any questions about that before we get started? Questions? You just said, what about the dissent? We don't quote it? Lochner is one of those cases which called, here I'll give you the word, there, there, there are these two phrases which are used in a book. There's the canon. Right? I always misspell it. The canon and the anti-canon. The canon refers to like the canonical cases, the important cases that define constitutional law. The anti-canon are the opposite. These are cases you should never cite. 
So if you ever find yourself writing a brief and you want to cite Dred Scott, you probably shouldn't. If you're ever writing a brief, you find yourself citing poor moths, you probably shouldn't. Um, Lochner falls into that category. Um, you can cite Roe and Griswold, that's fine, but not Lochner. Um, but I want to study Lochner carefully because there, 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 there's a lot of, there are a lot of things going on in this decision which might not be obvious when you first read it. Okay, so really quick, Oh, what did I say? Canon refers to important cases of the following. Our constitutional law, you know, our body of law, right? These are, you know, Marbury, McCulloch, Maryland, um, Youngstown, right? Like, big cases. Um, and you can have a case that you should not cite. <laughs> By the way, the, the advertisement in, in your book, uh, the Lochner Bakery advertisement, um, my co-author stole this from me without giving me credit, but now I'm the co-author, so I can I don't have to complain anymore. Uh, but I actually discovered this. It was found in uh, the Utica Historical Society. I wrote letters to them back in the day. And this is an advertisement for the bakery. If you ever come to my office, uh, I have it hanging on my wall. I have a huge print of it. Um, and it says, uh, Lochner's Home Bakery is one of the oldest and most reliable bakeries in central New York. We pride ourselves on uniformity, purity, and cleanliness. I have some pictures. Uh, this is Joseph Lochner and his family. Okay, here are bakers uh, are working in the shop. Um, one thing to understand, and this is again hard for us to understand, we live in a world of regulation. Right? Does anyone ever work in a kitchen or a restaurant somewhere? How many rules do you guys have to follow when you're making food? A lot, right? Insane number of rules, right? With the hair net and the glove, you know. There was a time where these didn't exist, right? The notion of having any sort of restrictions on a business was just not known, right? Today, you don't even think anything up. That, that's like the world you live in. But in the 1890s, that simply wasn't the case. If you wanted to be a baker, all you needed was an oven, right? If you wanted to open a bake shop, you got an oven, and you start baking, and you'd be selling bread at the back of your store. And if your bread was good, people might buy it. And if the bread made you sick, they'd probably stop buying it. But you didn't have health inspections, right? You didn't have um, a sanitary restrictions. It did not exist. So at the time, it was very common uh, for immigrants to run bake shops. Why? It doesn't require a lot of equipment. Literally, all you need is an oven, right? You get the dough, you flatten it out, get some flour, bake it, whatever if you need an oven. And it was very common that bake shops would be put in the basements of tenement houses, right? Why in the basement? Because these ovens were really heavy. And you couldn't put it on the second floor, probably cave through the floor. So you would put the, 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 this, you know, this heavy kiln, right, on the first floor. And if you notice when they're baking bread, there's a lot of waiting involved, right? You have to roll the dough and you have to wait for it to rise. Okay? You put it in the oven, you have to wait for it to bake an hour or two, right? So there's actually a lot of waiting. So the way these immigrant <coughs> bake shops would usually run is they'd be 24-hour operations, where you'd have a shift roll along the dough, you let it rise, you go take a nap for an hour, right? Put it in the oven, and they sleep again. So you had basically around the clock people working to keep this bakery going. And these were mostly, uh, mostly German immigrants from other, other Eastern European nations who were simply trying to make good. Um, trying to make dough. I'm sorry? <laughs> What'd you say? Trying to make dough. Oh, that's so good. Oh, They're trying to make some dough. Very good, very good. <laughs> yeah, I really needed that. So the, um, oh, don't get me started. I need it. There it is. <laughs> don't get me started. Please don't, don't. I'm I, I, I a sick kid for puns. It's terrible. rise. I'll, I'll rise. <laughs> By the way, I'm, I'm actually a Yankees fan. I'm in a weird spot right now. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, get out. I should have said it. Yeah, I'm in a weird spot. These are three so. of us. You know, it's a seven game series. It'll be a long series. But anyway, but the, the backstory here, and this is nothing new, um, is that a lot of the more established businesses weren't so happy that you had. Uh, these small immigrant bakers crowding on their market share, right? Because uh, usually the immigrant bakers could probably make on a much lower margin. They only had a couple people in their family, probably were sleeping on the floor between shifts, right? This was, this was the world. 
So this bake shop law had competing motivations, shall we say, right? <coughs> Some of the people who supported the bake shop law were doing it out of a, a good heart, right? They were doing it to increase sanitary conditions. They were doing it to prevent the overworking of these workers. Uh, but there's another motivation for these sorts of laws. It was to put the immigrant bakers out of business, and I can't say that too bluntly, right? Why? The only way these immigrant bake shops stayed in business was by working probably 80 hours a week. They had no choice. And usually what they would do is, again, they would, they would roll some dough, take a nap, let it rise, when it wakes up, then put it in the oven, and then this was the process. If you're a bigger bakery, you don't need to work one person 80 hours a week. You can hire several shifts. So to keep a 24-hour shift going, you need basically a lot of people working fewer hours, or a few people working many hours, right? This is just simple math. And it should come as no surprise, generally immigrants work always long hours. That's, that's generally how this operated. So you have this law, this bake shop law, where some of the provisions were governing health and safety things. And then you had the 60 hour a week provision, which almost exclusively would put out of business the small bakers. Now, how did this case arise? It was a setup, right? This wasn't a case where Joseph Lochner chained his worker to the floor and said, you must work 61 hours, right? That wasn't the case. The guy was willingly able to work because he wanted to. This is his living. And they challenged it by knowingly breaking this law. And as a result, they got arrested. And they challenged then the constitutionality of the Bake Shop Act. With me so far. Did you change your hand up? So there were several provisions of this law, only one of which was invalidated by the court. So, for example, Section 111 said that you have to have proper drainage and ventilation. Section 112 said the ceilings had to be a certain height. Section 113 said you'd have washrooms. Uh, sections 114 and 15 concerned inspections, right? The court didn't touch those. The court said those are exercises of the police power. Those provisions are fine. Even though they probably would have put out of business most basement bakeries, right? Because most basements don't have very high ceilings and they don't have ventilation and drainage. But the only provision that um, upset the apple cart, so to speak, was section 110, right? Which is a 60 hour a week restriction. And it basically made it a crime to work more than 60 hours a week. So the way I like to explain this law is a concept from economics known as Baptists and bootleggers. Don't ever hear this phrase? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone saying yes. Who said yes? What is it? Prohibition. I'm not sure that my description. Yeah, give it a stab. <laughs> Try it. It has to do with uh, people doing whatever they can to make money versus, you know, Christian right and, you know, get rich or die trying. Yeah, basically. Anyone else? Ever? Well, as you described it, you know. Oh, she cheats. It's okay. Give it to me. That's the only reason I know it. Yeah, do it. Uh, it's basically during Prohibition, the Baptists didn't agree with anybody drinking. But the bootleggers had a uh, different reason is that they wanted to sell their alcohol for a higher price. Oh, right. Who are the biggest supporters of prohibition? Right? You think, oh, it's the Baptists, right? Because the Baptists don't like alcohol, no one should drink, it's sinful. But there was another group that supported prohibition the mobsters, right? The bootleggers. Why? Because they can even couple the amount of money they sell their alcohol for if it's illegal. Right? During prohibition, you had to go to speakeasy, you had to buy alcohol from a, from a mobster. That's how it worked. Does anyone live in a dry county or from a dry county? On the border of your dry county, what is your liquor store? Do you know why your county is still dry? Yes. Why? <laughs> because of the religious. Uh, and? Uh, well, I don't know. I guess. The liquor store. Oh. I promise you, that liquor store lobbies <laughs> to keep that prohibition in place because otherwise he has a monopoly. That's interesting. It's right at the border, right? 
Well, yeah, they're completely surrounded. Like all the towns surround the town. Anyone ever see like on the border of the fireworks stores, right? You ever see that? Mm -hmm. You cross the border, there's always a firework store. Yeah. Store. Same idea. Um, <clears throat> whenever you have this sort of social legislation, there are generally different groups competing to get it in. So you have the Baptists, right? These are people who want it for good. And uh, uh, people want these sanitation laws for health. They want these labor laws to protect the worker, right? And they have you know, good motivations. Uh, then you have your bootleggers, right? Who are your bootleggers here? The big bakers. The big and they want to put it a business, the immigrant bakers. And this is this is not a mystery. You can read about this from entire books written about it. I gave you a sample of one, right? Um, you have different competing motivations. Now, Justice Peckham's majority opinion of Portland, what was he more attuned to? The concerns of the Baptists about creating safety? Or the concerns of the bootleggers and trying to mess with people's contract rights. What was he more attuned to? Sorry? The bootleggers, the contracts? Yeah. What was motivating Justice Peckham's majority opinion here? By the way, one of my uh, one of my my comma professor uh, wrote a book, a very very well received book called Rehabilitating Lochner. And the, and the cover is actually just Peckham knocking at Justice Holmes. I told him not to use his cover. I didn't like it, but it, it, it's funny for class. Looks like Phil Page. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pretend you to hear that. <laughs> Back to you, Portland. Who is, what is Peckham's motivation here? <laughs> right. Is he concerned about the oppression of the worker here? Why not? More concerned about the worker. Oh, that's kind of, is it? Mark, we'll go to you, Mr. Wise Guy. Um, <laughs> he's a fellow New Yorker, I suppose, so I'll have to give him some. Uh, who are you rooting for this week? Yeah, yeah okay, then I'll get you. Oh, and that will beat up on you later. Um, unfortunately, I actually was looking to get tickets, but I'm not going to be here for either of the home games. I'll actually be in New York when they're back and forth. So crazy. Um, I did go to one, a game, one of the. Uh, the, uh, the LDS versus Boston. It's a good game. Um, I went right after class and <laughs> ran over. Um, Mark, why is Peckham so concerned about the ability of the workers to negotiate their own wages and hours? What's this? What's motivating his decision here? Um, that uh, li limits on the the federal government to interfere with state's police power. Well, it's not the federal government, it's the federal constitution. I think that's what you mean. Right. But why is the federal government, or I'm sorry, the federal constitution abridging the police power? Why is that problematic? Why can't the state operate to protect workers from unfair contracts? Why is Peckham so upset about this law? What about it? Why isn't it just protecting people from unfair contracts, making them work too much? Um, the act must have a, a more direct relation as a means to an end, and the end itself must be appropriate and legitimate before an act can be held to be valid, which interferes with the general. You're, you're giving me stuff I'll be asking about 10 minutes. So. Why <laughs> is he so concerned about this law? What about this law bothers him so? It's just taking away an individual liberty. What liberty is this law taking away? To work as many hours as you want to work. Okay. Why is that a liberty protected by the Constitution? Uh, because it's part of your, it's part of your pursuit. It's part of your, if you want to work more to get more money, and that's that's your that should be your decision. Okay. This word liberty, right? How do we know what this word liberty means? So I guess we don't. But and and like you said, there's not a lot of case law on it, so you have to approach it, you know, on a case by case basis. And he mentioned that there were some some things that that could be regulated, uh, you know, some different types of contracts that could be regulated. Uh, and so I guess in that case, 
that would be the part of regulation that, you know, would, like Martin was saying, living in the free society, <coughs> you know, you have to take some laws with it. But th this was not a case where, you know, the rights of a worker were, were being shot down by big companies. This was a case of just a person wanting to work more hours so he could earn more money. Martin. Um, why did the court uphold all of the uh, other provisions about the ventilation and about the plumbing and the you know, bathroom stuff? Why did the court have no problem upholding those regulations? Did those not restrict Joseph Lockner's liberty of contract? Well, they had. If, if you wanted to have a dirty bakery and charge less for bread, why couldn't he do that? Uh, the the police the public policy behind the those laws was to to have the cleaner bread. And that those restrictions were more tightly connected uh, to. What's uh, this connection? What are you talking about? What have we? are getting this connection business from? From your lecture last semester. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, should, I, I repeat myself, I suppose. But yeah, so, by the way, if you want to get a hint of how to do well in this class, that's how you do it. It's not that hard. Um, uh, trust me on this one. I, I, I don't make up new stuff every year, although it's probably a little different. Um, you're right, Martin. Thank you. <laughs> the court admits there is a police power. And the police power can protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people. So what Peckham's getting at is there has to be some connection, some fit between the means and the ends. Right? Right? So you have the means, you have the fit, and you have the ends. What do I mean by this? The means is your approach, right? What, what exactly are you doing, right? And the ends are, what is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? So if here, the goal is clean bread, and your law says you have to have proper ventilation, you have to have proper drainage, uh, uh, Bahar, is there a pretty close fit between having clean bread and, um, having, you know, proper ventilation and, and inspections of this sort. Is there a very close fit there? In other words, if you're going to have regular inspections, is that probably going to make the bread cleaner? Yeah. Okay. So I think everyone would agree. So if you have this tight fit, this relationship between the means and the ends, Peckham says, well, uphold it. And that's how he goes up ahead to uphold the, you know, the, the most of the provisions of this law. Now, Bahara, the follow-up question is this. What is the relationship between the 60-hour week limit and clean bread? What's the relationship there? Mm -hmm. I'm guessing there isn't really one. Oh, is there? Can you think of one? Can you think of why limiting the number of hours a person works in a bake shop might make bread cleaner and more healthy? I'm sure you're going to get one. Well, there's health, I guess. Yeah, why? What happens when you work a lot of hours? God, law students, right? When you work a lot of hours, what do you start doing? <laughs> you don't work as efficiently. You make mistakes, right? So what can an overworked baker do that perhaps uh, an underworked baker would not do? What is the risk of having an overworked baker <coughs> sleep deprived? Oh, um, well, Yeah, they can drop the bread, pick it right up, right? They can maybe fall asleep in the dough. I don't know, right? You can make up 101 reasons why a bake shop that has overworked staff might be unhealthy. Mark? Well, to this point, and, and I was surprised that it never came up throughout the opinion, when he talked about the legitimacy of, an, of a police power over the mine workers in Utah, they don't really talk about that, that you know, being a baker takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, but it also takes a lot of heat. And it's like fires start out of bakeries. And these are like, that, it's have like, you worked a bakery? Yeah, I, well, pizzeria, my family owns pizzeria. So it's like the, uh, it's almost like a modern day, like meth lab, you know, right? <laughs> like it's a time bomb. And if you've got a, a baker that's, a, that's asleep at the wheel, he's gonna start a fire. And these buildings were all made out of wood. There was like part of the act was like they were talking about how they had to plaster the walls and things yeah. along those lines. And so I think that that was a bigger factor in this decision, especially coming out of New York City, 
where God knows how many fires were started by bakeries in, in Manhattan and in Brooklyn you know, because of bakers falling asleep at the wheel. So, so Ashley, do the court seem to think that the profession of baking is more or less dangerous than the profession of mining, for example? No. Why not? Um, well, there, I believe it was in, I don't remember if it was in your video or in this, the reading, but there was no restriction on working at multiple bakeries. Oh. It was just working at one bakery for more than 60 hours. Ah, so you could fall asleep at one and then snap at the other one, right? Even though they knew yeah. the odds were yeah. So I, th I, th I, think, I think Mark and, and Ashley are on, on to a good point. The court's basically saying this is not like working in a mine, which is an inherently dangerous field, right? This is a bakery. What's the big deal? You have an oven, you have dough. How's it dangerous? I think Mark raises a fair point. You got basically an explosive device. If you screw up the oven, these are probably either wood or coal burning, and you don't watch yourself, you can ignite the entire building on fire. You're in a basement without adequate ventilation. You could really screw stuff up right there, right? Um, but this goes back to the lottery, right? Emily. How do we know if this regulation is reasonable or not? What 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 standard could possibly be used to decide that the ventilation and the plumbing standards are fine, but the 60-hour week standard is not? Well, I think the standard was, or that the court used, was determining like the effects of the law. The okay, tell so me what were the effects of this law? Well, it put a person in jail. Yeah. Put a person in jail to prize their life, liberty, well, not their life, at least, but their liberty and their property. That due process of law. But is that sufficient to accomplish this goal of having clean bread? Throw a guy in jail. Is due process of law afforded by putting this guy in jail for selling, having three bakers work three hours? So what I'm, what I'm getting at here um, is this. It's inherently a judgment on reasonableness. And the majority thinks that our laws for dangerous professions like a minor is justified. But our laws for something like a bake shop is not justified. And we even throw in some statistics which show that bakers don't have any longer or shorter lives than other professions, you know, what, what, what their lifespans are. And that this liberty of contract prevails. That if a person wants to have the liberty right to negotiate a 70 hour week labor contract, they can do that. And the police power does not interfere. So we're going to get the majority opinion, at least. And here's actually the, the way the court framed the holding. Uh, the act must have a more direct relation as a means to an end. And the end itself must be appropriate and legitimate before an act can be held to be invalid. So it, it has a sense of measuring the fit between the means and the ends. Uh, at the very end, almost like in the last page of the majority opinion, uh, Justice Peckham basically says that this is not really a health law. There is no direct relation and no substantial effect to the health of the employee. The real object and purpose was simply to regulate the hours of labor between the master and his employees in a private business. The freedom of contract, just as Peckham writes, cannot be prohibited without violating the Constitution. Adam? Was this a result of what essentially were the industries in New York <coughs> in the early 1800s that were like sweatshops? They were what? Essentially sweatshops, you know, with immigrant workers working for yeah. almost nothing, you know, 20 hour days. Yeah, I mean, Locker Lock himself was an immigrant. The owner of the shop was an immigrant as well. So, was, was that what the result of this law was? was uh, there were some there were some progressives that were trying to shut down sweatshops, but the primary impetus for this law was to uh, make it harder for these bakers to compete. 
I'll, I'll give you another example. There was another case decided later called Jay Burr's <coughs> Baking. And it involved a law which said that bread must be a certain weight, right? And that all, like a loaf of bread must weigh a certain amount. And you might think, oh, what's the big deal? Now, I have tried baking, I'm terrible at it. I can never estimate how much bread will weigh when I start making the dough. To get that, you need actually some sort of equipment that, that can measure with some precision how much yeast, right, whatever. So this law, which seems, oh yeah, if you want to have bread that's a certain weight, that's to standardize, right? It basically puts small bakers out of business. So these laws, which seem neutral, are primarily designed to make it harder to compete. Like I can never figure out how much yeast to put in it. It goes all over the place. Right? Your, your pizza, I'm sure, was perfect. You got it down to a science, right? Uh, that's my aunt's recipe. Uh, share that. <laughs> Is that what you're raising your hand to tell me? Well, no, I was <laughs> to, to Adam's point, is that the jumble was released in 1906. Exactly. And this case was 1905. Up, Upton Sinclair wrote a very high profile report of the meatpacking industry in Chicago. And people had never really understood. I mean, if you think about it, before Urban Center, if you wanted meat, you go down to your local butcher and you had a small shop. But here you had basically these humongous meatpacking industries that didn't have any sort of oversight. So this is all part of the same period. Emily, I think your hand was up as well. Yeah, I just had a question about, is this another example of the evil eye and unequal hand? I think it is. I mean, what Harlan, I'm sorry, what Peckham is basically saying is, this law basically neutral, but it's designed to punish uh, people and abridge their contract rights. I think that once you go past the face of the law, that, that, that implicates the evil eye, I suppose. Very good. Anybody else in the majority about Peckham? <laughs> Rufus Peckham, what a name. Let's do Harlan. Right, we were talking about Harlan before. What am I up to? Am I you next? No, I called you. Yeah, yeah. What did Harlan say? Uh, I didn't really like understand what Harlan said. Uh, I'll give it a step. Overall, but um, <coughs> he kind of sort of talked about the like the health implications of this act a little bit, where he was talking about. I know he mentioned what you mentioned earlier about how if bakers work long hours and how that can be detrimental to public health and uh -huh. to that nature, and how there's some sort of like relationship between that and the right contract, and that's sort of. Like does, Shubin, does Harlan agree with the majority that this liberty of contract exists? Uh, no. No, that's wrong. Brittany? Does Harlan agree that liberty of contract is protected by the 14th Amendment? Yes. Why? Where does Harlan know that the 14th Amendment protects his right of contract? Well, is it the most general limits? Kelly, where does Harlan know that the 14th Amendment actually guarantees his liberty of contract? Why do you even think this is the case? Friend? Uh, the state actually has the police powers. Well, that's, the states have the police powers, but why is the lawyer of contract? Okay. We looked at the Constitution. Okay, we can look at the Constitution also. It's right up here. What does he see in the Constitution? Right? Why is liberty including the lawyer of contract? Text right up here. Mm -hmm. um, what have you got? Well, it's very expressly stated. Um, expressly? What's it expressly stated? Um, that, that liberty is a part of. But why would you contract? How do you know that's one of the liberties protected here? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do want to be able to ask you. How does Harlan know that we be protected here? Is Ari up to get that? That's, that's on the right track. In case you want to add something? Is, is it from the like the slaughterhouse cases where they say that the um, where the privileges is the, the right of contract? The slaughterhouse case ruled against the butchers though, didn't they? Yeah. So how's that gonna work? Well they because it was a, a trivial right, like <coughs> I'm 
someone else running for president? Another husband and Justice Peckham's uh, opinion of the court. He said the general right to make a contract in relation to his business is a part of the liberty of the individual protected by the 14th Amendment of the federal constitution. And he cited Al? Al here in Louisiana. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good start. Basically, I'll, I'll shortcut the debate. Um, there's no express discussion in the 14th Amendment's text concerning a right of contract. You can get at it in a couple different ways. So if you look at the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1866, which came before the 14th Amendment, that expressly mentioned the right to make contracts and the right to negotiate wages and the like. But there's no clear-cut rule that the 14th Amendment guarantees liberty of contract. Harlan's opinion here, I think you have to read it on the same level as the opinion in the first case, the Chicago case. He's saying, how can you have a free society where the government can arbitrarily restrict your right to make contracts? For him, this is a matter of fairness. Right? It's, it's really, a, a, the, the opinions work well together. Um, this right to earn a living exists, but the difference between the majority and the dissent is that Harlan would give a lot more operation for the police power and would allow far wider abridgment of this right of contract than would the majority. But Yami, why does Harlan think, even though this right of contract exists, the statute should survive? What, 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 what sort of test does he give forward? What test does Justice Harlan give to know whether a law abridges the slippery of the contract? I want to be honest. I was overworked yesterday, but I made a mistake, and I read next week's Tuesday's reading instead that's, of today. That's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you tomorrow. I'll be super okay. ready. You'll be ready for time. next one. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Rachel, yeah. what test, what does Harlan give to know when the slippery of the contract has been infringed? So the states still have the police power. Um, but like it's over like unhealthy trades is what he referred to so they can still exert their police power when it comes to like maintaining the health and well-being of their of people but not so much that it's arbitrarily interfering with individuals personal liberties under what circumstances does harlan think courts should be in the business of striking down laws for violating this liberty provision what what has to be shown um, he has a very specific test. Yeah. Jessica, that, yeah, you next thing. What? He says that the burden of proof is on the person trying to get a contract. Very good. The burden of the challenger. What do they have to show? That they expressly contradict Anyone know the exact language I'm looking for? Is there? I'm wondering that the validity of the statute is questioning the burden of proof. So to speak, is upon those who asserted to be unconstitutional. Very good. And then what will be shown? Anyone know the other part I'm looking for? Mark? Bad faith. Not just bad faith. It is um, properly. That's it. That's it, Rita. Yeah. Properly unauthorized by law. Yeah. So the, you should not hold the law invalid unless it's beyond question, plainly, and palpably in excess of legislative power. If there is any doubt, the doubt must be resolved in favor of validity. Let the legislature meet responsibility for unwise laws. In other words, let democracy fix it. All right, so here's the test I'll read it to. You. If the end which the legislature seeks to accomplish be one to which its powers extend, and if the means employed to that end, although not the wisest or best, are yet not plainly and palpably unauthorized by law, then the court cannot interfere. In other words, unless this is absolutely unconstitutional, there's no way of avoiding it, the court should simply defer to the democratic process. Right? This is what you might call a posture of restraint that the court should not intervene unless there's no other option. <clears throat> That's the difference between Harlan and the 
majority. The majority was asked, is there a good enough fit between the means and the end? Harlan's like, wait a minute, if there's, if there's some way to find that this makes sense, that's fine. You don't have to have a tight fit. If you want to compare this to another case, this is very similar to Marshall and McCulloch v. Maryland, right? Let the ends be legitimate, let be within the scope of power, uphold it. So this is basically Harlan saying, we'll give the same deference we give to Congress under the Necessary and Proper Clause that we would to the states under the police power. <coughs> Hmm. Alright, so any questions on Harlan? Questions on Harlan? Yes, ma'am. When he says whether or not this be wise legislation is not the province of the court to require. Yeah. So he's that's the deference he's giving to Congress for the state. To the state legislation. Um, does that tie into deciding a justice deciding what's fair or not. Uh -huh. So he's basically saying it's not our decision. It's not up to us to decide what's fair. That's exactly what he's saying. But what did he say in the, take the, the Chicago case? Didn't he? He did, did he? Very good. So there are difficulties with Holmes, uh, Harlan's opinion, right? Because he just said a few years earlier, you can't have a just society unless you have this compensation. Um, but here, we're not here to decide what's just or not. Uh, I guess you can have your cake and eat it too at Lochner's Bakery, but, but this it's, it's a difficult case. Um, and then we go to Justice Harlan, I'm sorry, Justice Holmes in dissent. And, and Holmes was dissenting all by himself. No one else joined him, right? All right, Daniel, what, what's Holmes' opinion here? Um, that there's no uh, What's he talking about there? I think Boone said earlier this French word. <laughs> what does laissez faire mean? It, it literally means hands off, right? Any French speaker? It's hands off, right? It, it was an economic theory which basically said the government should not be intervening in markets. And what Justice Holmes says, it's one of the most famous dissents of all time. I think it's overrated, but one of the most famous dissents of all time. Uh, but I, I think Holmes is the second most overrated justice ever. Who's number one? John Marshall. Not a big gap, I think, mean, way overrated. But but Holmes um, says that this case is decided on an economic theory uh, which a large part of the country does not entertain. And they're talking about laissez-faire capitalism. And he cites this book, Mr. Herbert Spencer's Social Statics. Uh, uh, people often think it's talking about social Darwinism. That's actually not right. It's talking about laissez-faire capitalism. And he says, if I, this were a question whether I agree with that theory, I would have to study it. But the 14th Amendment doesn't embrace economic liberty, so this is an easy case. Because this state imposes no restrictions, I'm sorry, because the 14th Amendment doesn't impose any restrictions on the police power, this is an easy case. He cites a few decisions, one of which is Jacobson versus Massachusetts. This is a law that required mandatory, ster oh, a, one more. mandatory vaccination. Mandatory vaccination. That in a city, I think it was in a, a, a Boston somewhere, uh, there was a smallpox outbreak. They wanted to vaccinate people. Now, this is not like Jenny McCarthy anti-vaxxer stuff. This is more vaccines could actually kill you back then. It was giving you a small strand of the virus, so it was actually quite dangerous. Um, uh, vaccinate your children, please. Uh, but the, the 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 rule here is he's saying we're not in the business of judging the wisdom of legislation, right? If this law passed the democratic process, that's good enough for me. The Constitution was made for people of different economic theories. And we can't decide it based on our own beliefs. Um, Justice Holmes famously once said, if my fellow citizens want to go to hell, I will help them get there. And he sure as hell meant it. Uh, but so long as a reasonable person might think it a proper health measure, that's enough. Okay, so Harlan would agree that there is this right contract. Holmes would dismiss this all together. The question is on the Holmes dissent. Question the Holmes dissent. Yeah, sure. How does it differ from from Harlan's dissent? It seems to say the same thing. Oh, it doesn't. Not even close. What does Harlan say about the existence of right of contract? Does he say the Fourteenth Amendment protects such a right? Uh, he says that it does not. 
That's wrong. What were we just talking about before? Does Harlan think the 14th Amendment protects a right of contract? He does. He does. And what does Holmes say? Holmes says that... Does such a right exist? No. That's the difference. Right? The big difference between Holmes and Harlan. Holmes says the right doesn't exist at all. Harlan says it exists, but it can be regulated in this fashion. Everyone see that? Andrew, you're squinting. Yeah, I think it's going to read it a little more closely. Yeah. Yeah, Mark. So when he says that, I think that the word liberty in the 14th Amendment is perverted when it is held to prevent the natural outcome of a dominant opinion of, uh, you know, fair men, rational and fair men. Is that kind of like in alignment with the court's opinion in Mueller, basically saying that, like, it's very clear that the physical capabilities of men exceeds women, and so we shouldn't stretch the, the meaning of the word liberty from the 14th Amendment to go against what I think What I think he's saying there is the definition of liberty is whatever democracy gives it. And the democratic process de de decides that this liberty can be violated, this contract right, it's not for the courts to second guess. I don't believe that, by the way. You can say whatever you want. You don't have to apologize. Uh, but the point is he doesn't <laughs> think that the courts are in the business of deciding and intervening. Right? Right? Uh, this Holmes belief that the 14th Amendment, the word liberty, basically means whatever democracy wants it to be, uh, is easy enough to embrace in this case. But you'll read a case about a week or two called Buck v. Bell. If you want to read ahead, this case involves a mandatory sterilization law, where if the government determines people to be mentally incompetent, which basically means anything they want, they have to go for a uh, sterilization, have their tubes tied, or have a vasectomy. And Holmes cheerfully upholds that law because in his mind where liberty has no meaning. It's whatever the democracy wants. So you can take Lochner for what it's worth, and you should, uh, but it has implications when you do. Okay. Are there questions on Lochner? Questions on Lochner, All right? Uh, the long and short of it, this is not good law anymore, and we'll talk about when it gets basically reversed shortly, but uh, uh, Lochner is no longer a good statement of law, and then probably any other law class but mine, you'll say it's evil, it's awful, I have a somewhat more sympathetic view. I'm, I'm in favor of Harlan, I think Harlan probably gets it closest to right, uh, but uh, the uh, Holmes opinion, I, I, I do not sanction. Next, any other questions on, on, on Lochner? All right, let's move through the rest. Um, Buchanan v. Worley is a case that I assign, and in fact, I also assigned the dissent. You guys got that from the supplement? You are the only students in the country who read that dissent. It, no one even knows it exists. I discovered this a couple years ago, and I just inserted it to the book because I think it's important. But this is a case that shows uh, well before Brown, while Plessy was still um, prevailing law, uh, the courts actually were able to use this liberty of contract doctrine to um, uh, fight against racial segregation. Um, so the facts of the case were like this. You had a Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky law that basically said a white person couldn't buy a house on a block that was predominantly uh, populated by African Americans and vice versa. So it's separate but equal, right? You have your white neighborhood and you have your black neighborhood. Right? That, that was the law. And under Plessy, um, that was all the law required. So this was challenged not as a violation of equal protection, because Plessy wasn't going to be touched. Instead, they challenge it as a violation of liberty contract, that if a black person wants to sell his home to a white person, or vice versa, they should be allowed to do it. That's an arbitrary infringement upon their economic liberty. So, who am I up to? Andre, are you next? I think you are. What did the court hold here in Buchanan? You are late. Uh, they held that it was. Um, that the ordinance was unconstitutional. That's right. Why was unconstitutional? Because that, because black, because restricting the neighborhoods by color is not a legitimate exercise Very of good. the police power of the state. Very good. They said the means did not fit the ends, right? Right? The means didn't fit the ends. You want to have a police power of a safe, you know, uh, community? 
Okay, that's a legitimate goal perhaps, but using racial segregation is not a legitimate means to get there. And what we see here is an affirmation of liberty of contract, that the right to sell property is important, and the court can't arbitrarily interfere with it. All right? Now, Jonathan, what, what was Holmes's beef in his dissent, it was probably about a page or so, it was pretty short. <coughs> By the way, this was, again, this was a dissent that was not published. He circulated it, and no one would join him, so he basically withdrew it. He's like, whatever, screw it, right? It's like when you want to go to a movie and no one wants to join, so you rent it instead. Uh, uh, yeah? Is that why they also used unanimous? Because I looked at this case. Oh, I know you did. It was The final vote was unanimous, but Harlan... But he did dissent? He did not publish his dissent. This was kept secret. This was, was confused on. I was oh, like, they all say it's unanimous. I know they did. It was unanimous. This was an opinion which he circulated but never published. And it was found in his papers after he died. And all of Holmes' papers were published in several big volumes. And this is one of the documents published in volumes. I only discovered this a couple of years ago. I went crazy when I saw it. I came across somewhere I can't remember. Because I'll actually I'll tell you. Um, I was thinking to myself, how could Holmes not dissent in this case, right? He dissented to Lochner, right? He wrote the Buckley Bell majority opinion. The guy doesn't believe where liberty means anything. I'm like, how did he go along with this? So I started researching for a few hours and I came across this. He actually had an unpublished dissent. Now, it doesn't count for anything. It's not real, but this gives you what he actually thought. It tells you what you really think, right? Jonathan, what does Holmes really think about this? Yeah, who raised it? Who was the plaintiff? The white guy. Does Holmes think the the Fourteenth Amendment protects white people at all? Does he does he think it's even relevant? No. What does he think? Who should have brought this case? Yeah. He thought only the African American buyer could bring this case, uh, which is a, which is a striking thought. That's actually what he believed the Fourteenth Amendment protected. But moreover, was he happy about how this case came about, Jonathan? Did, did he think that this was really adversarial, that the plaintiff and defendant were against each other? Uh, Why not? Um, what, what, what was Holmes's beef here? His beef? Yeah, why was he upset with the way the case was brought? <laughs> You know what I'm thinking of? That it was fake. It was a test case, yeah. This was set up. This was a setup, right? You have basically civil rights groups want to say, let's challenge this law. You have a white person, a black person, they're a voluntary transaction. There's no adversarialness, right? This wasn't an actual challenge. So I was like, I would get rid of this entire case. But um, he basically says the 14th Amendment doesn't protect this right of contract, and it was meant to protect. Uh, uh, African Americans and not, not 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 white people. It's a very strange opinion, um, uh, which I include for this exact. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, Mark. Well, I wondered about that. Why was it Buchanan versus Worley? I think you touched upon it at the beginning, but I didn't fully understand. Shouldn't it have been like Buchanan against whatever state this was, Kentucky? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, I'll look it up later. He was like the administrator. One at a time. I, I think my my recollection was the defendant was the um, the defendant challenged. Uh, let me get back to him then. Yeah. I think it said that that um, you can sold the house to Warley. Yeah. And then Warley uh, said, I'm not going to pay you because I can't live in it and I only buy this property so I can live in it. So Buchanan sued him to pay for the house and then said that the law that is preventing this guy from living Yeah, but still, why would he be suing the seller and not the state? It's a good question. I don't know the answer. I, I'll look into that later. It's actually a very good question. Uh, maybe that's why Holmes was so upset because it was basically it was, a, it was a bogus case and should have been suing the government. That's it. I'll look, I'll look up later. I don't know the answer. I actually read the lower court opinion at some point. I can't remember what it was, but I do read the check later. Okay. Is there any other questions on Buchanan? I want to do Mueller and Atkins at one.
uh, in, in one swoop. Because they're, they're basically mirror image of the same case, right? So Mueller versus Oregon concerned a law which prohibited women from working more than 10 hours a day. Okay, and these are actually the ladies working in laundry at the late house laundry. Atkins v. Uh, Children's Hospital of DC concern a minimum wage law for women. Okay, now there's a strange aspect of this case, Anthony, reading this. What, what was very, maybe jumped out at you reading these cases that, that was maybe surprising? Why they had a minimum wage law or a maximum hour law just for women? Because they were inferior gender to males? Yeah, right? So here we have Lochner, which is saying these rugged bakers, they can work as many hours as they damn well please, right? And then you go on to Mueller, and it's like, well, the, 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 the women uh, aren't able to um, uh, uh, be sturdy enough, be strong enough, and they need the protection of the state. What case does this remind you of? What case? The female lawyer case. What was, it, what was the name of it? Bradwell. Bradwell, mm -hmm. yes, Bradwell. It, it, it's similar in Bradwell that it recognizes this inferiority of the, of the sexes, that these women are basically inferior, and they need heightened protection. And because they're inferior, their ability to contract is not as strong as men, right? But then you go on to the next case, Atkins, which takes a different perspective, right? What case, what does, what does Justice Sutherland say in Atkins about women and, and just in general? Uh, he's saying the way they felt about them in the, in the prior case is not necessarily the stereotype, I guess, is going on there. Yeah, he's saying, look, maybe in the 19, was it 1908, 1908, that there were these, um, you know, perception of women as being unequal, but we had the 19th Amendment. The 19th Amendment gave suffrage, right, the right to vote to, uh, to women. And that changes things, right? And, but here comes the, the, the strange part. Because women now have this level of equality, they can make their own contracts so they don't need the protection anymore of the state with the minimum wage, right? See what that is? It, it, it's almost backwards once you think. The more equality the women have, the less they need a minimum wage law, and therefore the minimum wage law becomes unconstitutional. So you might think that a minimum wage law protects women, right? But the court sees it the exact opposite. The existence of this law is a recognition that they are inferior, that they need special protections men don't. So to actually promote their equality, the court has to validate the minimum wage law. Everyone see that? It, it, it's not what you think. You think, oh my God, to protect women, of course, you know, the women are, are just equal as men. They need a, 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 a wage just the same. But the court says, no, 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 no. Because they're now equal, they don't get these protections that men don't. Isn't that kind of how, what the argument was in uh, the rail car case where it was talking about if, if black people wanted um, to not be the inferior case that... Let them negotiate for themselves. Yeah, let them, let them make their own way, right? Yeah, I think that that's actually a fair point. And so the argument is this. They can make their own way because they're equal. And therefore they don't need the protection of this minimum wage law. No, Carla, you're next. Was that possible? I mean, is that truly uh, how they saw it, that that was recognizing their right? Or do you think that that could have been kind of like, okay, you wanted it, you asked for it, all right, there you go, let me... Uh... Well, the justice who wrote uh, Atkins was Justice Sutherland, and he was actually a fairly pro-suffrage justice. He introduced the 19th Amendment in the Senate uh, during the ratification process. And he, in his personal writing, said that women had full equality and they should be able to do as men. So, I mean, I guess it's a compliment from Justice Sutherland saying, look, you're just the same as the bakers in Lochner's shop. Therefore, you should be able to negotiate however many hours you want, and you should not be controlled by this. So that's the thing that's hardest to get, that you may think that a minimum wage law or a maximum hour law is a good thing, right, something you would want. The majority is like, no, 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 they're bad things. The, the fact that you need a minimum wage law or a maximum hour law is a recognition of your inferiority. To equalize, equalize, to equalize you, we need to get rid of these vestiges that limit you. Yeah. Pulling from a class time this morning in fourth, where in the 1960s we're looking at, you know, that they still recognize defamation 
against women as a, a violation of you know, liberty and as a means of protection. But, you know, it seems contrary that 40 years after this, the court's still saying, well, we still have protection. What does Holmes say here? Beloved Justice Holmes, right? Carla. What did Justice Holmes say in Atkins? Um, what does he say about the ladies in Atkins? Is that what Holmes says? Uh, that's in his dissenting opinion. I'm more than the 19th Amendment to convince me that there is no difference between men and women. Well, no, no, what do you say? It will, you need more than the 9th Amendment to convince me. You will, you will need more than that to convince me. Sorry. That there are no differences. Uh, Read it again. There are no differences between men and women. Right. So does Holmes think there are differences between men and women? Uh, no, opposite. You need more to convince me. So he says, it will need more than 19th Amendment to convince me that there are no differences between men and women, or legislation cannot take those differences into account. What's he saying there? It will need more than the 19th Amendment to convince me that there are no differences between men and women, or that legislation cannot take those differences into account. What's he saying there? So he's saying that the 19th Amendment alone does not mean that there is uh, that men and women Good. Yeah, there are a lot of double negatives there, right? Yeah. The 19th Amendment, he says, didn't establish this equality between the genders. It did not. So he is basically sticking with the um, Mueller opinion. And the Mueller opinion, I think this is in this third edition, not in yours, was based in large measure by what's called the Brandeis Brief, the brief submitted by Louis Brandeis. And the entire brief was filled with this science, I call it science in quotes, of why you need this law. And why was this law needed? Because men and women were physically unequal. And one of my favorite claims is that women have a higher water content in their blood. And as a result, they can't work as hard. Uh, there was also some claim, I might be making this up, but I'm pretty sure it's there, that if women work too hard, their uterus would fall out. Uh, 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 <laughs> if it wasn't in this brief, it was somewhere else. But that was actually a concern. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know I'm getting ahead because it's hard. You have ahead. But um, would West Coast Coast College then? That overturned this case. Yeah. West Coast Hotel in Paris was from 1936, right? Um, 37. 37, I'm sorry, 37. That overturned this case. Very good reason. Well, it would have been great if I worked for this case. Yeah, I one time when I was in law school, I think it was Citro, and um, a professor called the students and said, oh, I read for the long, wrong class. I said, I read this case. They were like, OK, if you ask me questions for that case, just hold it. No, I, so, I, I believe you. Can look I trust you. I see your highlights. It's very pretty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you think a fallacy in Atkins could be something that you don't talk about on Sunday? In that Sunday class, which is like, if Plessy or the civil rights cases have been done differently 100 years later, you know, would people still feel the same way? Do you think they want now what legislation might provide over time? Which is, so do you think this decision asking helped to hurt women's uh, equality? It would hurt, I think it would say it hurt women. But why would it hurt them if it's extremely important to men? Because I think that there's there's principle and theory in how you think about things and then how society works. And so in society, even today, men try to pay women less. And it's taken a long time for women to get to a point where they can really fight for an equal wage fairly. And, and even now, they still don't always get it. Um, and I think that perhaps, had the legislation gone through, it might have become the standard or the norm. And it may have reached the point where it wasn't necessary. Well, as, as Adiyami alluded to, about 10 years later, this case was overturned. It didn't last very long. Who was Shanda? No. What? No. OK, so then they're <laughs> They had an argument similar to you about the universe falling out, so. Yeah, that was in there somewhere. All right. So what, what's all this saying, right? These cases were somewhat all over the map. But throughout the 1910s, 1920s, there's a period that's also called the Lochner era, which is not a very precise name, um, because a lot of these cases involve state laws, some involve federal laws. But during the so-called Lochner era, the court 
embrace this robust notion of substantive due process to invalidate both state laws as well as federal laws. Atkins was a federal law in the District of Columbia as violations of the Libyan contract. Um, this was viewed as a thorn in the side of progressives and the Roosevelt administration. And ultimately, in the case I had mentioned, West Coast Hotel v. Parrish, 1937. The Supreme Court upheld a minimum wage law from the state of Washington. It directly overruled Atkins. It directly overruled Atkins. Um, Lochner has never been formally overturned, but West Coast is generally understood to have nullified the basis on which Lochner was decided. Now you're asking, Josh, why do I need to know about Lochner whose case is overturned? Um, the reason why is that the same sort of doctrine that was used in Lochner, even though it was killed during the New Deal, was resurrected. It came back to life during the 1960s and 70s as the Supreme Court began to provide protections for various social, personal, autonomy rights. I mentioned before, birth control, abortion, sodomy, marriage, assisted suicide. The courts began in the 60s and 70s to resurrect the Lochner Doctrine of reading substance into the word liberty and using that doctrine to invalidate state laws as well as federal laws that run afoul of it. The same question of what is the relationship between the means and the ends, right? You ask, does a law impose a uh, substantial obstacle to obtaining an abortion, right? What is the health interest? Why does Texas want to have this law? What health interest do they have versus what obstacle does this give to obtaining an abortion? What is the reason why Texas, it's always Texas, that Texas wants to ban sodomy? What state interest are they trying to achieve and what's the fit there? So this relationship between means and ends, right, that this framework, the means and the ends, we'll keep coming back to this over and over again. As the judges, and it's usually a five-four case grappled one or the other, about what the appropriate fit is between the means and the ends. Any questions? Yeah? I always That's exactly why you look at this case. Also, I need you. Uh, I, I reserve the right on the exam to ask you about certain time periods, so you gotta know that anyway. Right? Yeah, she's still talking, please. Okay. No, 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 she's not. She's, 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 she